twilight settled over Zuckerman's barn and a feeling of peace. Fern knew it was almost supper time, but she couldn't bear to leave. Swallows passed on silent wings in and out of the doorways, bringing food to their young ones. From across the road, a bird sang whir whirl whip poor will whipper will. <laughs> Larry sat down under an apple tree and lit his pipe. The animals sniffed the familiar smell of strong coat tobacco. Wilbur heard the trill of the tree toad and the occasionally occasional slamming of the kitchen door. All these sounds made him feel comfortable and happy, for he loved life and loved to be a part of the world and on a summer evening. But as he lay there, he remembered what the old sheep had told him. The thought of death came to him, and he began to tremble with fear. Charlotte, he said softly. Yes, Wilbur? I don't want to die. Of course you don't, said Charlotte in a comforting voice. I just love it here in the barn, said Wilbur. I love everything about this place. Of course you do, said Charlotte. We all do. The goose appeared, followed by her seven goslings. They thrust their little necks out and kept up a musical whistling, like a tiny troop of pipers. Wilbur listened to the sound with love in his heart. Charlotte, he said. Yes, said the spider. Were you serious when you promised you would not you would keep them from killing me? I would. I was m never more serious in my life. I am not going to let you die, Wilbur. How are you going to save me, asked Wilbur, whose curiosity was very strong at this point. Well, said Charlotte vaguely, I don't really know, but I'm working on a plan. That's wonderful, said Wilbur. How is the plan coming, Charlotte? Have you got very far with it? Is it coming along pretty well? Wilbur was trembling again, but Charlotte was cool and collected. Oh, it's coming all right, she said lightly. The plan is still in its early stages and hasn't completely shaped up yet, but I'm working on it. When do you work on it, begged Wilbur? When I'm hanging head down on the top of my web, that's when I do my best thinking, because then all the blood is in my head. I'd be only too glad to help in any way I can. Oh, I'll work it out alone, said Charlotte. I can think better if I think alone. All right, said Wilbur, but don't fail to let me know if there's anything I can do to help, no matter how slight. Well, replied Charlotte, you must try to build yourself up. I want you to get plenty of sleep and stop worrying. Never hur hurry and never worry. Chew your food thoroughly and eat every bit of it, except you must leave just enough for Templeton. Gain weight and stay well. That's the way you can help. Keep fit and don't lose your nerve. Do you think you understand? Yes, I understand, said Wilbur. Go along to bed then, said Charlotte. Sleep is important. Wilbur trotted down over to the darkest corner of his pen and threw himself down. He closed his eyes. In another minute, he spoke. Charlotte, he said. Yes, Wilbur. May I go out to my trough and see if I left any of my supper? I think I left a little bit of mashed potatoes. Very well, said Charlotte, but I want you in bed with, again without delay. Wilbur started to race out to his yard. Slowly, slowly, said Charlotte. Never hurry and never worry. Wilbur checked himself and crept slowly to his trough. He found a bit of potato, chewed it carefully, swallowed it, and walked back to bed. He closed his eyes and was silent for a while. Charlotte, he said in a whisper, yes. Hey, get a drink of milk. I think there are a few drops of milk left in my trough. No, the trough is dry, and I want you to go to sleep. No more talking. Close your eyes and go to sleep. Wilbur shut his eyes. Fern got up from her stool and started on home. Her mind full of everything she had seen and heard. Good night, Charlotte, said Wilbur. Good night, Wilbur. There was a pause. Good night, Charlotte. Good night, Wilbur. Good night. Good night. Chapter 10, An Explosion. Day after day, the spider waited, head down for an idea to come to her. Hour by hour, she sat motionless, deep in thought. Having promised Wilbur that she would save his life, she was determined to keep her promise. Charlotte was naturally patient. She knew from experience that if she waited long enough, a fly would come to her web, and she felt sure that if she thought long enough about Wilbur's problem, the idea would come to her mind. Finally, one morning, towards the middle of July, the idea came. Why, how perfectly simple, she said to herself. The way to save Wilbur's life is to play a trick on Zuckerman. If I can fool a bug, thought Charlotte, I can surely fool a man. People are not as smart as bugs. Wilbur walked into his yard just at that moment. What are you thinking about, Charlotte? he asked. I was just thinking, said the spider, that people are very gullible. What does gullible mean? Easy to fool, said Charlotte. That's a mercy, replied Wilbur, and he lay down in the shade of his fence and went fast to sleep. The spider, however, stayed wide awake, gazing affectionately at him and making plans for his future. Summer was half gone. She knew she didn't have much time. That morning, just as Wilbur fell asleep, Avery Arable wandered into Zuckerman's front yard, followed by Fern. Avery carried a long, a live frog in his hands. 
Fern had a crown of daisies in her hair. The children ran for the kitchen. Just in time for a piece of blueberry pie, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Look at my frog, said Avery, placing the frog on the drain board and holding up his hand for pie. Take that thing out of here, said Mrs. Zuckerman. He's hot, said Fern. He, Fern, he's almost dead, that frog. He is not, said Avery. He lets me scratch him behind his eyes. The frog jumped and landed in Mrs. Zuckerman's dishpan full of soapy water. You're getting a pie, your pie on. You're getting your pie on you, said Fern. Can I look for eggs in the hen house, Aunt Edith? Run outdoors, both of you, and don't bother the hens. It's getting all over everything, shouted Fern. His pie is all over his front. Come on, frog, said Avery. He scooped up his frog. The frog kicked, splashed soapy water onto the blueberry pie. Another crisis, groaned Fern. Let's swing on the, in the swing, said Avery. The children ran to the barn. Mr. Zuckerman had the best swing in the county. It was a single long piece of heavy rope tied to the beam over the north doorway. At the bottom end of the rope was a fat knot to sit on. It was arranged so that you could swing without being pushed. You climbed a ladder to the hayloft. Then, holding the rope, you could you stand on the edge and look down and were scared and dizzy. Then you strapped, straddled the knot so that it acted as a seat. Then you got up all your nerve, took a deep breath, and jumped. For a second, you seemed to be falling to the barn floor far below, but then suddenly the rope would begin to catch you, and you would sail through the barn door going a mile a minute, with the wind whistling in your eyes and ears and hair. Then you would zoom upward into the sky, look at up at the clouds, and the rope would twist you and would twist and turn with the rope. Then you would drop down, down, down out of the sky and come sailing back into the barn, almost into the hayloft, then sailing out again, not quite as far this time, then in again, not quite so high, then out again, then in again, then out, then in, and then you'd jump off and fall down and let someone else try it. Mothers for miles around worried that Zuckerman's, about Zuckerman's swing. They feared some child would fall, but no child ever did. Children always almost always hang on to things tighter than their parents would think. Avery put the frog in his pocket and climbed to the hayloft. The last time I swing in this swing, I almost crushed into the, a barn swallow, he yelled. Take that frog out, ordered Fern. Avery straddled the rope and jumped. He sailed out through the door, frog and all, and into the sky, frog and all, and then he sailed back into the barn. Your tongue is purple, screamed Fern. So is yours, cried Avery, sailing out again with the frog. I have hay inside my dress. It itches, called Fern. Scratch it, said Avery as he sailed back. It's my turn, said Fern. Jump off. Fern's got an itch, sang Avery. Then he jumped off and threw the swing up to his sister. She shut her eyes tight and jumped. She felt the dizzy drop, then the supporting lift of the swing. Then she opened her eyes. She was looking up into the blue sky and was about to fly back through the door. They took turns for an hour. When the children grew tired of swinging, they went down toward the pasture and picked wild raspberries and ate them. Their tongues turned from purple to red. Fern bit into a raspberry that had a bad tasting bug inside of it and got discouraged. Avery found an empty candy box and put his frog in it. The frog seemed tired after his morning in the swing. The children walked slowly to, up toward the barn. Then two, they too were tired and hardly had energy enough to walk. Let's build a tree house, suggested Avery. I want to live in a tree with my frog. I'm going to visit Wilbur, Fern announced. They climbed the fence into the lane and walked lazily towards the pig pen. Wilbur heard them coming and got up. Avery noticed the spider web and coming closer, he saw Charlotte. Hey, look at that big spider, he said. It's tremendous. Leave it alone, commanded Fern. You've got a frog, isn't that enough? That's a fine spider and I'm going to capture it, said Avery. He took the cover off the candy box and he picked up a stick. I'm going to knock that old spider into this box, he said. Wilbur's heart almost stopped when he saw what was going on. This might be the end of Charlotte if the boy succeeded in catching her. You stop it, Avery, cried Fern. Avery put his leg over the fence of the pig pen. He was just about to raise his stick to hit Charlotte when he lost his balance. He swayed and toppled and landed on the edge of Wilbur's trough. The trough tipped up and then came down with a splat. The goose egg was right underneath. There was a dull explosion as the egg broke, and then a horrible smell. Fern screamed. Avery jumped to his feet. The air was filled with the terrible gases and smells from the rotten egg. Templeton, who had been resting in his home, scuttled away into the barn. Good night, screamed Avery. Good night, what a stink. Let's get out of here. 
Fern was crying. She held her nose and ran towards the house. Avery ran after her, holding his nose. Charlotte felt greatly relieved to see him go. It had been a narrow escape. Later in the morning, the animals came up from the pasture. The sheep, the lambs, the ganders, the goose, and the seven goslings. There were many complaints about the awful smell, and Wilbur had to tell the story over and over again of how the arable boy had tried to capture Charlotte and how the smell of the broken egg drove him away just in time. It was that rotten goose egg that saved Charlotte's life, said Wilbur. The goose was proud of her share in the adventure. I'm delighted that the egg never hatched, she, gam she gabbled. Templeton, of course, was miserable over the loss of his beloved egg, but he couldn't resist boasting. It pays to save things, he said in his surly voice. A rat never knows when something is going to come in handy. I never throw anything away. Well, said one of the lambs, this whole business is as well and good for Charlotte. But what about the rest of us? The smell is unbearable. Who wants to live in a barn that is perfumed with rotten egg? Don't worry, I'll get... You'll get used to it, said Templeton. He sat up and pulled wisely at his long whiskers, then crept away to pay a visit to the dump. When Larvy showed up at lunchtime carrying a pail of food for Wilbur, he stopped short a few paces from the pig pen. He sniffed the air and made a face. What in thunder, he said, set the pail down and picked up a stick that Avery had dropped and pried the trough up. Rats, he said. Phew! I thought a, a known a rat would make a nest under this trough. How I hate a rat! And Lurvy dragged Wilbur's trough across the yard, kicked some dirt in the rat's nest, bearing the broken egg and all of Templeton's other possessions. Then he picked up the pail. Wilbur stood in the trough, drooling over with hunger. Lurvy poured. The slops ran creamily down around the pig's eyes and ears. Wilbur grunted. He gulped and sucked and sucked and gulped, making wishing and whooshing noises, anxious to get everything at once. It was a delicious meal. Skim milk meal me, wheat medlings leftover pancake half of a donut the rind of a summer squash two pieces of stale toast a third of a ginger snap a fish tail one orange peel several noodles from a noodle soup the scum of the cup of cocoa an ancient jelly roll a strip of paper from the lining of the garbage pail and a spoonful of raspberry jello wilbur ate heartedly he planned to leave half of half a noodle and a few drops of milk for Templeton. Then he remembered that the rat had been useful in saving Charlotte's life and that Charlotte was trying to save his life, so he left a whole noodle instead of a half. Now that the broken egg was buried, the air cleared and the barn smelled good again. The afternoon passed and evening came. Shadows lengthened. The cool and kindly breath of evening entered through doors and windows. Astride her web, Charlotte sat moodily, eating a horse fly and thinking about the future. After a while, she bestirred herself. She descended to the center of the web, and there she began to cut some of her lines. She worked slowly but steadily, while the other creatures drowsed. Some of the others, not even the goose, noticed that she was at work. Deep in his soft bed, Wilbur smoothed. Over in their face favorite corner, the goslings whistled a night song. Charlotte tore quite a section out of her web, leaving an open space in the middle. Then she started weaving something to take the place of the threads she had removed. When Templeton got back from the dump around midnight, the spider was still at work.